Hey folks, it's Jared Mananin from the website TahoeTrailGuide.com. Today I'm going to bring you a brief introduction to the world of classic cross-country skiing. Right off the bat, I just want to let you know that I'll probably interchangeably use the words classic, traditional, or striding throughout this series of videos and tutorials about classic cross-country skiing because they're all synonymous. There's classic cross-country skiing, traditional cross-country skiing, diagonal striding or striding and it's the same kind of skiing it's the type of cross-country skiing that uses some type of a grip zone or textured base on the bottom of the skis that allows you to push forward in order to travel across snow quite certain that I've mentioned it in more than one video, but I do prefer classic cross-country skiing over skate skiing due to its versatility. You can pretty much go anywhere on classic cross-country skis so long as you're proficient with the technique of diagonal striding. So we're going to talk about classic cross-country skis today, but I'm mostly going to focus on the skis themselves. I will show a couple of demonstrations to illustrate some of what I'm talking about, but mostly I just kind of want to talk about the geometry and characteristics of a classic cross-country ski. I'm going to grab two right now. So classic cross-country skiing, cross-country skiing in general are the skinny skis. You can see they are very skinny, although these are not as skinny as some racers classic skis. They're a few millimeters wider because they're essentially a recreational pair. But I just want to show some different qualities of these skis that help you propel forward across snow. So the first thing that many people notice when I hand them their skis in the rental shop that I work at is how skinny and light they are. And they are skinny and they are light. The idea is that with classic skiing, we're not just skiing downhill. We're skiing a lot on the flats and uphill. So if you were to be bogged down by really heavy ski you just get exhausted right away it'd be no fun right so they're made super light super skinny and they're also made pretty straight right so if we look down these these are long straight skinny skis and that's to help you track straight so these types of skis they want to go straight across snow you can definitely turn with them and eventually i'll post videos about how to do turns on classic cross-country skis but essentially they want to go straight and the turns that you will be making on classic cross-country skis will be a variation of going straight you're gonna basically go straight around a corner when speaking with people new to cross-country skiing I always try to encourage them to be patient when learning because in spite of its appearance classic cross-country skiing is deceptively complex I apologize, but it appears that I began recording a little bit too late in the afternoon because I've lost the sun. It's not going to make the information any less valuable. It's just going to have a little bit of a different lighting scheme for the rest of the video. But, as I was, a classic cross-country ski, in addition to being long, straight, and skinny, has what's called a grip zone. So this is one of the real defining characteristics of a classic ski. It's this area under your foot that has either a scale pattern of some sort, a textured surface, possibly a skin type of a surface area, or it's completely smooth and designed to be used with a sticky grip wax. So this is what enables us to push off the snow so that we can propel forward. And it's a super defining characteristic of a classic cross country ski. With that said, there's what's called camber to a cross country ski. And camber is this graceful arc that is in the ski. And I don't know if you'll be able to see this or not, but it's not perfectly flat, that's for sure. And the idea behind camber of a cross country ski is that it keeps the grip zone off the snow while you're gliding so you're not grabbing dragging, gripping the snow when you're supposed to be sliding over it. And in a track ski such as this, designed to be used on one of those groomed tracks, it's what they call a double camber. I don't want to get into the specifics of it, but just know that the first camber spans the entire length of the ski, and then the double camber spans the length of the grip zone. And again, it's so that you can go as fast as possible, and that means keeping that grip zone off the snow 
Admittedly, I look a little rusty in these demonstrations, but keep in mind that I'm running a pair of backcountry cross-country skis that I'll show you in just a minute in comparison to those track skis that I pulled out. But there's about eight inches of soft, smushy snow on top of some dried grasses. So there's not really any base of which to speak, and that makes pushing off hard. It's hard to commit to your next stride when you have like a spongy base beneath you. But overall, I guess I don't look too bad, in spite of that big old summer gut that I have going on there. I'm looking forward to getting some consistent days of skiing in because I need to lose a few pounds. So this one is much wider than this one. It's also shorter and it has a more aggressive grip zone on it, meaning the grip zone occupies much more real estate on the base of the ski than a track ski or a race ski, for example. This one, Again, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details, but a lot of the backcountry cross-country skis I don't think have a true double camber. They have a definitely a single or one and a half camber. How they measure that, I don't know. But um, you'll notice that when you run an off-track ski, you're going to hear the scales dragging a little bit more because of the length of the grip zone as well as the softness of the camber. But in both situations, they're designed specifically for a purpose. On a track ski, you're gonna have a much more uniform surface because it's groomed that way. In the off track, you're gonna have less of a uniform surface, so you're gonna want more of a grip zone, and having a little bit softer ski to grip the snow is gonna be a lot easier. But I'm gonna to continue to just use the track ski for illustrative purposes, so I'm gonna put this back. So with this camber, with this grip zone, because it's arced up, there's gonna be a tendency for you to slip and slide unless you properly flatten the ski out. We call it compressing the ski, making it flat. So you're using your body weight to push down on the ski so it flattens the ski and it grips the snow. However you wanna visualize that, just know that you have to press that ski down with your body weight so that you can push off, so that you can step forward. And this is a key element that a lot of beginners don't realize. They assume because there are scales on the bottom that they're just going to be able to go ahead and ski everywhere or walk everywhere safely. It's not quite that simple because of the camber keeping the grip zone off of the snow. All skis, whether they're some form of alpine ski or a telemark ski, feature some sort of camber to them. But compared to a cross-country ski, they look flat. If you hold the bases of two cross-country skis together, you can literally put your hand between both of them. And even when you're just standing on a pair of classic cross-country skis, you can feel the aliveness inherent with them because they're so springy because of that pronounced camber system. One of the main reasons I say classic cross-country skiing is deceptively complex is because you can walk around, you can shuffle around, and you can have a good time but you're not necessarily doing technique at that point. And understanding the geometry of the ski and how you need to move your body in order to move forward in an efficient and effective manner is key to having a good time and being safer, being able to travel further, explore more terrain, and just generally get to and from places a lot quicker. So understanding how the camber is related to the grip zone is related to your body movement is vital to enjoying your time while classic cross-country skiing. So if we were talking about that double camber system again, you can split your weight between both skis as if you're going downhill, for example, and you won't drag the grip zone. I'm gonna interrupt myself and clarify that last statement. If you're running a pair of classic cross-country skis with a waxless base, in this case, a scaled grip zone, Invariably, you're going to drag those scales over the snow at some point or another. The reason I say this is because a grip zone for a classic cross-country ski is super specific to the ski and the skier, that there's no way a manufacturer could ever, with 100% certainty, predict exactly where your grip zone will be. And because that scale pattern grip zone is fixed, meaning you can't really do much about it, it's part of the ski's base, there's a high probability that that grip zone extends a little bit further outside of what you would need. Cross-country ski manufacturers do this probably intentionally so that they don't get a whole bunch of complaints from people saying that they don't get any grip with the ski because the grip zone was too small.
Just know that this is one of the chief complaints by experienced cross-country skiers. They can't stand the fact that they're dragging that scale pattern grip zone as they're going because when you hear the scales dragging, that means friction, and friction is the enemy of cross-country skiing. All of that said, I personally believe that the benefits of having a scale pattern grip zone far outweigh any of the problems associated with dragging the scales a little bit. The reason I do like a scale pattern grip zone is simply for the fact that it's pretty much never going to change. You can always depend on it in every snow condition. And because I ski variable terrain all the time, particularly in the backcountry, this is a very good thing for me. Once you start to transfer all of your weight onto one ski for the push-off phase of diagonal striding, and I haven't really covered that a whole lot, but just bear with me, then you can flatten the ski down enough that the grip zone grips the snow and you can step off, you can push forward, that sort of thing. So that double camber requires a little more oomph, a uh, drop in your body weight in order to completely flatten this out. And I notice a lot of beginners that don't quite understand that concept. And another funny thing, deceptively complex thing about cross country skiing is that majority of time you're actually skiing on one ski there's very few times other than double pulling and going downhill that you're on both skis and splitting your weight between the two generally speaking all of your weight will be on one ski and then to the next and back and forth back and forth so i'll cover that later but just know that to effectively set the grip zone to compress to flatten the ski so that you can push forward you need to decamber the ski press it down into the snow and that requires you putting all of your weight onto one ski so it becomes frustrating as an instructor to watch people doing this constantly going back and forth and it tells me that the grip zone is not adequately being pushed into the snow or gripping the snow it means that all this glide surface so flanking the grip zone or the glide surface and that's where we glide and slide over snow if you're not putting enough pressure on that ski you end up kind of going back and forth and doing this little um, three stooges shuffle down the track again we have a long straight skinny ski that wants to travel long straight distances and it has this graceful arc that allows you to glide without dragging the grip zone on the snow but knowing that there is that arc you can now put weight onto each ski so that you can flatten it just for a fraction of a second so that you can push forward you can move forward and that's really the goal is forward momentum everything that slides back is just wasted effort it's a frustrating time and again you look like Laurel and Hardy or the three stooges out there and as funny as they are to watch it's much more enjoyable to watch somebody who knows how to perform technique Clearly I'm going to have to keep that editor on staff because he sure knows how to add a nice segue from clip to clip. All jokes aside, I'm doing a slight variation on these mini demonstrations by putting myself on loop. I'm actually starting from either a slight walk or shuffle or a complete standstill to full diagonal striding. And this is why I encourage people to take actual lessons. You shouldn't need momentum to keep making forward progress. Each step you take, every time you push off, should be in a forward direction, regardless of whether or not you're already in motion or you're at a complete standstill. For the most part, that's all I want to cover today. Why don't we chew on those ideas a little bit for the time being, this idea of a grip zone and this camber and how can we use our body weight and our body movement in order to flatten that ski out so that we can move forward. Again, deceptively complex and it's taken me many years to really feel comfortable and confident in diagonal striding. but. Oh my gosh, it's so much fun. And it's applicable in the back country. So even though these skis are wider, 
Uh, they're a bit shorter. They have a longer grip zone. They have a metal edge. You use the same diagonal striding technique on these skis. You could totally use them as a snowshoe if you want, but they're way more fun when you actually develop your diagonal striding technique and you can go just further in the back country with less effort. Getting dive bombed by birds. Yeah, why don't we chew on that for a little while? Let's think about that grip zone. Let's think about that camber of the ski and try thinking about how we can use our body weight and body movement to compress the ski to set the grip zone into the snow so that we can move forward. Okay, if you liked the video, give it a thumbs up. Post any questions or feedback in the comment section below. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and then check out TahoeTrailGuide.com. I have a bunch of articles about the specific aspects and geometry of classic cross-country skis on Tahoe Trail Guide. I encourage you to go read them and take a look at the photos that I've included in those articles. I sincerely apologize again for all the wind and road noise, but I do appreciate you sticking around and watching. Take care, everyone.